Okay, so um, colored glyphs in open type. And I thought I would start with something that was not computer related at all, but with some nice uh, carved wood stuff just to show that colored glyphs aren't anything new, really. Okay. Uh, these slides are not on the web yet since I just finished writing them, but they will be once I've finished talking and I'll put them up and give you a link. So here's a, an example of what we might call a chromatic type. Obviously the design has been split up into several pieces and uh, there's some transparency so where they overlap you get a darker effect. Yeah, it looks okay. It looks quite nice. Am I moving out of your view too much for the camera? No good. So anyway, and I've, I've tried to give credit where I can to who, who produced the type. Let's have a, a quote from Mr. Filipov. He says, of course, this could never be turned into a real font, because what he actually gives you is a bunch of Adobe Illustrator files, which you can then drag into place in various ways in the line to give the illusion of colored type, whereas in fact you don't have that at all. Um, so this, what this talk is about is to prove that his quote may have been true when he said it, but it won't be anymore. So let's look at the early stuff. Um, Adobe Postscript Type 3. Type 1 was the one that took off because you could use it, and Type 3 was the one that could do everything and didn't take off because it didn't work in Adobe Type Manager. Uh, Amiga OS had a color font, raster only, but you know, raster can still be useful for some things. That one didn't take off because nobody uses the Amiga anymore. SVG fonts uh, was a short term hack so that when people did some type and converted it to curves, you could save the curves and say this is what they were originally, and we had the barest level of internationalization that could just about do Arabic shaping, and, and that was about it, and it kind of sucked, but there we are. Um, it was actually quite nice because the definition of a glyph was anything SVG can draw. Swallow the mic. Um, <laughs> Act like a rock star. Okay. Um, so SVG fonts, um, people mostly hate them because mainly they only come across them now because there are some iOS devices which can only use SVG fonts for some reason. Um, so, and th these are going away, by the way. In SVG 2, there will be no SVG fonts anymore. In Japan, NTT Docomo phones had uh, colored glyphs for emoji, for uh, Japanese teenagers to text each other and things. Um, okay, uh, but that was in Japan, so we didn't care about that here. And then there were a bunch of script or CSS based workarounds which let you align various text multiple ways. That's fine in print, it doesn't work very well on the web. On the web, you have to do sort of CSS hacks like colon before, colon after, all this sort of stuff to try and hide the text away that you're duplicating. I mean, these are all very clever, but there should be a better way to do it. So there's some, oh bugger. Sorry. Back. There's some emoji just in case people haven't uh, seen what these are. Um, there's at least two Firefox rendering bugs in that page. Anyone here from Firefox? No? Okay. Um, if you don't know about emoji, you, there's one word in Japanese that you have to understand. Kawaii. Okay, that's what you say whenever you see these things. All right. Um, so that's what they are, and the thing is, they started in Japan, but they then became deployed much more. Two other major Japanese phone vendors also put them on. They were almost interoperable. Unicode 6 made them actually interoperable. Uh, and therefore, there was a need. Suddenly, people went, having ignored the needs of chromatic fonts for ages and ages, they suddenly went, oh, I suppose the Japanese phones were going to have to do something about it then. So Apple came up with something called SVIX, which shipped in iOS 6. They did not bother to document it. It has been reverse engineered multiple times. And since they can't be bothered to document it, I can't be bothered to talk about it. Uh, Google, on the other hand, came up with a similar proposal. Uh, they did document it completely. They provided some open source Python code to actually let you create these things. So you notice that the dates that we started off with we were in 1984 and now we're up to 2013. Don't worry, just sit down. You're all right. So really, this is kind of up to the minute stuff. In you come. You weren't here when I dissed your overlay stuff. It's okay. 
so basically, emoji was the catalyst for change, but it's not all you can do with chromatic fonts, not by a long shot. So let's have a look at what Google have. There's a couple of tables which are by analogy to the monochrome tables already in OpenType. They contain a 32-bit blue, green, red, alpha in that order, pre-multiplied, which means you've not got much color information for the highly transparent parts. There's a certain subset of ping tags that you can use if you know about ping, that list is meaningful to you. If not, don't worry about it. There is no animation, although there is an animated ping now, so I don't know what they would do if they get one of those, probably just pretend it's not animated. And this was implemented in FreeType 2.5 June last year, which means that it's in a bunch of things that use FreeType, like Android, for example. Microsoft, meanwhile, so both of these previous things that I talked about were raster. You can have more than one size, but unless you've got the exact size that you want on the exact pixel grid that you want, you're going to have to downsample from a bigger one. So the advantages of hand-tuned, obsessive uh, pixel pushing go away really rapidly. Okay, so what Microsoft did was they came up with some two, two, two new tags. One uh, called color, which contains basically a stack of true type outlines, and one called CPAL, which is a palette. That means that they use a similar rendering path to existing true type. I say similar, not the same, because you still have to take it. If you have a single color and you rasterize it, you will have a certain amount of anti-aliasing around the edge of the background color. If you do that in a simple-minded way with multiple color things, then just slap them all together, you're going to have nasty white halos everywhere and it's not going to look good. Similarly, if you print it, you'll still have to do blocking and trapping. It can only do solid fill because each of the individual components can only have a single color fill. It does, however, have hinting, which means that most of the type guys really like this one better than all the others because they can continue to do obsessive hinting on it. It, however, has no gradients in animation, and as far as I can see, it can't really have them added very easily. It shipped in Microsoft Windows 8.1 in August. Uh, there was a presentation at TypeCon in August last year where Michelle Purim demoed this and showed it working. I don't have Windows 8.1, so I, can't, I haven't actually seen it working myself. But just to give you an example, this is the on-screen keyboard from Windows 8 with MOG, which are in glorious monochrome. And that is the same thing in Windows 8.1 using their own CPAL and um, palette, sorry, it's color and CPAL. So it works, allegedly. Okay, good. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that you can do with it. This is one of their demos. Ten minutes. Oh, I'm doing well. Ten minutes. This is a font called Mingle. It's obviously based on the old uh, American 19th century woodcut types, complete with do not cut this book and all sorts of stuff. I mean, they obviously had loads of fun making this demo. Uh, but as you can see, the top one is really solid colors, and the bottom one uses three or four colors together to give the illusion sort of of a gradient while not actually producing one. Okay, SVG and OpenType, which, to be honest, is the one that I'm most interested in. It was started as a W3C community group. Uh, why would you care that that was where it started? Because it comes under the W3C royalty-free license, which means that when we finished, we produced the final report, everyone had to sign off on it and make patent commitments on behalf of their companies, uh, which means that everyone has a royalty-free license to use it, whether they were involved in making it or not. And all of the companies who are involved in doing it have sort of a mutual non-aggression pact. If any one of them sues the other one for patent infringement, suddenly these free patent licenses that they didn't know they had a license to those patents all go poof, and suddenly they're liable. So it makes it very risky, deliberately makes it very risky to go suing each other for stupid patent stuff. Uh, and this has been implemented in Firefox 26. As of Firefox 28, it's turned on by default. Okay, so what's in it? You have one or more SVG documents. Glyphs within a single document can share resources like gradients or filters or whatever it is. You cannot link across documents, across SVG documents. Also, the actual document you're using it in has no access to the SVG. The SVG has no access to the document you're using it in. Uh, how many people have heard of CSS variables? 
Yes. I considered saying that, but they're actually now called CSS custom properties for various reasons, but that's the same thing, actually. Um, so you can use these because, okay, color fonts, these are great. Who wants to use the colors that were actually baked in by the font designer? You want to use your own colors in, that fits in with your own design. That's how you do it with SVG and OpenType. You use these CSS variables and custom properties. It does also use the CPAL table. We did a little bit of work with Microsoft uh, once these proposals came out to harmonize it. So CPAL is actually shared between the SVG table and the Microsoft color table. They can both use it. It's mandatory in the Microsoft one. It's optional in SVG. Originally, there was a notion of having double sets, so you could have a dark on light and a light on dark palette. That's sort of gone away now to a more general, you can have multiple palettes and name them and stuff. So what, what's good about it? Well, it keeps the expressive power of, of the graphics. You can do gradients. You can have opacity. You can have opacity masks. You can do clipping. You can have filter effects. You can have hatching. That's new in SVG2, but you can use that too. You can use animation. By the way, also new in SVG2. You're going to talk about that, aren't you? Never mind. Come to his talk about SVG2. You'll learn all the stuff that you can do in it. Anyway, basically, all the graphic stuff is still there, which is good. And then for people who worry about security, it uses the secure embedded subset of SVG. This is the same as you would use if you had SVG as an image element in HTML. What that means is there is no scripting. Scripting can't kick off. It can't fetch external resources. It can't go off to the web and grab other things. It can't call back home and say, someone's just used this font. This is cool. Click, 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 count. Um, there's no interactivity. It can't track where your mouse cursor is or anything nasty like that. Also, as another restriction, there are no text elements. It's kind of obvious. If you have a font and the font contains text elements, and the text elements have a font, and you'll disappear up your own. Right. Um, also, no foreign object. A foreign object is how you put HTML inside SVG, and having HTML inside a font glyph definition would be just kind of weird. So we stop that too. You can inherit. Um, you can get the system fill and stroke and the dash array and all that sort of stuff. You can bring that stuff in, use it how you want inside your SVG. So for example, you could take the fill color that's being used and use that as a stroke if you wanted. Oh, I should point out, by the way, that um, for SVG and OpenType, most of the other font formats that are vector, you would have to draw a closed shape and fill it in. You can do that too, but you can also just draw a line and stroke it, which is another way to do things. It's quite nice. And you can have overlaps as well, which is, again, nice. Um, I thought I'd been wildly out of time by this point, which is why I was speaking really, really fast. Um, five minutes. Awesome. In that case, I can hit you with a slide of code. Who's going to tell me what that does? I already told you what the first three lines are. It says, no, you can't have text, and no, you can't have foreign object. And there's two ways to define that. One is to have a spec that says, you must never put this in here, but people will. So this does, if you put it in there, it doesn't do a thing. It doesn't produce any rendering. It doesn't appear at all. The rest of it is basically bringing in stuff from the environment. It's bringing in SVG2 properties here that get you the context. It's sort of like inheritance, except instead of being in a tree system, it's where it's, something is used, not where it's defined in the tree. So it can be in a different place, which is useful here because the SVG document and the document you're using the fonts in are entirely different documents. So at the point at which text is using this font, the font can bring in what colors are being used right there and use them. OK, good. So let's now look at implementations. Um, I've, for the sake of space, I've used two euro signs to mean commercial, because I couldn't fit it in. So this first one is called Font Creator. It is, costs money. It runs on Windows. It supports the Microsoft Color CPAL only. Let me know when you've got that photo. The slides will be on the web in a bit. <laughs> but if you can't wait, that's fine. Here's one called glyphs.app, which I guess, as you can imagine, runs on OS X. It costs money. It supports something. 
The web page is quite coy about what it actually does and what it supports, but I believe that it exists. And there it is run, reading a, a Microsoft font, so apparently either someone's very good with Photoshop or it can read the Microsoft proposal. Robofont uh, also costs money, also runs on OS X, and also does the Microsoft One, and I don't know if it does anything else because, again, their documentation is a little sketchy. Transtype, this also costs money, it runs on both Windows and OS X. It claims to support all of the features. It claims to import SVG color fonts, which it does not, I have a bug in for that. It claims to export SVG in OpenType, which it does not. It claims to export uh, the Microsoft one, which it does, and I'd prove that, but since I don't have Windows 8.1, I can't actually run it, but I've had a look at the fonts, and it appears to have the right sort of bits in it. Uh, this is an example of, <coughs> excuse me, this is an example of a font which was originally sold as a set of nine. You uh, did the usual shuffle, you know, you bring in nine different fonts, put it on the same text, overlay it, line it all up, and put different fill colors on. It's based on Indian sign painting techniques, so it's called Kafil Painter. So this is actually one font made in about five minutes using this tool, so that's quite cool. Um, so far, these are all commercial. Google, as I mentioned earlier, has a Python script which lets you stick some pings into to, to make uh, their, their format, which is okay. It's not exactly a development environment, though. Uh, Robert O'Callaghan has a thing called SVG OpenType Workshop, which runs in a browser. You load in a, a font, you load in some SVG, it glues them together and spits it out. It's quite clever, but again, not exactly ideal. Implementations would be very welcome. Open source implementations would be wonderful for this sort of stuff. This is really cool. Let's not leave it in the hands of people that are trying to keep their own interests or have their own agendas or whatever. There's a lot of expressive power that can be used here. Let's go on and use it. Questions? So, yeah, first. Questions? Yes. I have to go this way. Are there any provisions to have switchable layers in these fonts? Like uh, the last example you showed, uh, probably had different combinations of these nine individual fonts, where you, which would all make sense basically. And a mechanism, so like to switch, a flip, flip a switch and uh, change. Right. The font. What, what you can't know, um, you you can't move around the layers in opposite order. They're basically for the SVG one, they're in the order that the SVG document has them, and for the Microsoft one, they're in the order that they are on the table. Uh, what you can do is you can switch them off effectively by setting them to transparent black or transparent anything. Um, so that, that layer will then not show, but you can't flip the layers to the order that you want. Uh, typically, what happens in both of these actually is that you have a base layer, which is uh, black or something. It's effectively the fallback layer. Um, and that's where the metrics come from. And then everything else has the same metrics, but takes up different space and you know takes up as much space as it needs to overlay and that sort of thing. Um, you don't have to do just overlay fonts in SVG. I mean, the example I showed did, but you can do all sorts of other stuff as well. Other questions for Chris? So let's get some free software implementations of this. Thank you very much. How many, pe how many people here could see yourself using this sort of thing if yeah. someone else made a tool for it? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs>